Um, so I'm going to start by um, <coughs> at a more basic level, not with the horocycle dynamics. And um, this is, uh, there's a sequence of four talks here where uh, Barack Weiss is giving the other two talks and they're all uh, connected in. Uh, so I'm going to start with um, one particular motivation of historical importance for studying uh, translation surfaces. And this is uh, rational polygonal billiards. Okay, so I'm considering uh, <coughs> billiard trajectories in a polygon. <coughs> and um, so billiard trajectories um, <coughs> behave so that the uh, they billiards are, I'm taking my billiard ball to be a particle. It moves in a straight line at constant speed. And then when it hits the side of the table, it reflects so that the uh, angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Um, <clears throat> so uh, general billiards are classical objects of study in dynamical systems. Uh, different shapes imply different dynamical properties. The uh, polygonal case is uh, interesting, but it's also uh, somewhat special, but uh, partly um, uh, it's special because it has special, spe especially interesting properties. Um, then the, uh, I want to put a condition on my table which is that, uh, <coughs> which is related to this rational property. I want each uh, uh, angle <coughs> to be a, uh, at, each, at each vertex, I want the angle to be a rational multiple of pi. Okay, so this is the collection. <coughs> Typically I'll call my uh, polygon uh, P. This is the collection of things that I want to study. And I'm interested in questions about long-term, typically questions about long-term behavior of billiard trajectories. <coughs> so uh, questions that one might ask. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so in, so, um, <coughs> uh, so questions. In general, I'm looking interested in long-term behavior of trajectories. Uh, how does that behavior depend on, first, the polygon, second, the particular direction of flow that I've chosen, and third, uh, the starting point? Okay. So here's some uh, sample questions. Um, <clears throat> if I pick a polygon and pick a, uh, a starting point, pick a starting point, pick a particular, particular uh, trajectory, uh, uh, what is the uh, sequence of sides uh, hit by a particular trajectory? Here I could imagine labeling my sides uh, A, B, C, and I get some sequence of A's, B's, and C's. Uh, this, uh, <coughs> this type of question is uh, closely related to questions discussed by uh, Pascal and Sasha last week. Uh, so. <coughs> They were mentioning coding sequences that one can construct from an interval exchange transformation. Well, I can think of the sides here as giving me one of these coding sequences. So uh, <coughs> what sides can be hit 
Uh, more generally, we could s our uh, kind of related question: <coughs> uh, What uh, sequences <coughs> of uh, sides uh, can be <coughs> hit by <coughs> some trajectory? in P, okay, so uh, right here I'm not fixing a trajectory in the starting point, but I'm just saying what are the possible sequences of sides. This particular question is important in uh, <coughs> um, actual, actually playing billiards. Uh, typically in billiards, in a serious game of billiards, you have to call your shot. Right? You don't just hit the ball and see what happens. You have to call your shot. So you're, typically you're telling your opponent before the beginning of, before your shot, what the sequence of sides will be. If you give a sequence of sides which actually can't be realized by any trajectory, then your opponent immediately doubles their bet right, on the game. So it's a relevant and important I just want to convey that I am talking about relevant and important problems here. Um, okay. <coughs> More questions that one could ask uh, <coughs> for uh, which uh, directions uh, theta. So I'm say given given <coughs> p for which directions. Uh, theta um, <coughs> are uh, all trajectories <coughs> directories dense. Uh, Sasha talked a little bit about this particular question in the beginning of her her talk. Uh, <coughs> Uh, you can, but you can also say, are all trajectories uh, uniformly distributed? So this is a more quantitative property, not more measure theory. This is more topological. Um, we can also ask uh, what uh, directions <coughs> correspond <coughs> to uh, periodic trajectories. Uh, typically in dynamical systems, so the periodic trajectories are very special trajectories. Um, but they, they have the property that if you found one, you know the behavior of your point for all time. Um, <clears throat> so it, typically in dynamical systems, it's often, given a system, it's often infinite, interesting to study the, uh, the periodic trajectories. And uh, another question, I mean, question related to periodic trajectories, <clears throat> which is do periodic <clears throat> trajectories uh, always exist. And uh, uh, how many, uh, if, if they do always exist, how many are there? OK, so I'm thinking here of, of a counting problem. Uh, we can look at period trajectories of a given length or <coughs> and ask how does that grow with the, the length, okay, if, they're, if we're indeed in a situation with infinitely many. Um, I just wanted to, to say this because there's lots of different ways of looking at, um, <coughs> at, uh, at billiards and indeed at translation surfaces. But, um, we're not going <coughs> to talk about all of these. So this is particular uh, topic that uh, Barack and I will be discussing. Okay. <coughs> um. 
Okay, so um, let me uh, say something about the connection between uh, rational polygonal billiards and uh, translation surfaces. I guess I could go up at this point. In a rational billiard, here's the uh, <coughs> classic case, for example. <coughs> so, as we know, in the in the standard um, <coughs> in the standard billiard table, if you uh, hit the ball, <coughs> it of course the direction changes when it hits. An, uh, an edge, but the total number of directions in which it travels is actually finite. All right, so, uh, so a trajectory uh, travels uh, in finitely many directions. Okay, so this is a sort of characteristic and defining feature of the rational uh, billiards as opposed to po general polygonal billiards. <coughs> um, so this would be one example. <coughs> Let's see, this would be another example. Uh, right, so one way to analyze these billiard trajectories is to uh, do uh, an unfolding construction. So if we, um, if we want to look at a particular trajectory when it hits a side, it's useful just to unfold our table and flip over that side that has the property of taking our, if we think of extending the tra trajectory path <coughs> in this unfolded, uh, in the reflected polygon, it has the property of straightening out the trajectories. Okay, so this, uh, <coughs> this particular polygon, so if we keep doing the unfolding, we can ask, ask how do those polygons either fill up the plane or not fill up the plane. Uh, in this particular case, uh, so this uh, polygon uh, tiles the plane. Uh, by reflection, Okay, so that means if we keep doing this unfolding procedure, then we can turn, somehow turn our uh, question about a uh, billiard trajectory into a question about a straight line in the plane, right? Because of this unfolding property. Conversely, if we have a straight line in the plane, it gives us a billiard trajectory. Um, <coughs> let's look at that, what that unfolding does for us a little bit. So if we... Uh, keep doing this unfolding uh, we get a picture like we get a <coughs> tiling of the plane that looks like this <coughs> uh, 
So this is a useful uh, construction, but uh, it's a second, a second observation. Sometimes it's useful. <coughs> Sometimes when you're doing this unfolding, it's sort of reasonable to stop when you get to these fr this first configuration of eight triangles. Notice that uh, eight is actually the, the, the number of directions in which your trajectory can travel. So um, if we just look at one collection of these eight uh, triangles, then we notice that if we, if we label our uh, if we label our edges, that um, <coughs> this side corresponds to A, so this corresponds to C, uh, this side corresponds to B, then C, then A. <coughs> Both of these sides correspond to A, but they correspond to A sort of going in the same direction, right? So it's what an, <coughs> another uh, option here is instead of sort of unfolding our, this polygon all the way, <coughs> we can just unfold, do this partial unfolding, then, um, <coughs> then identify uh, opposite sides. Okay? And uh, if we, <coughs> what, we've, what we construct in this way is a torus. And uh, just as we can uh, relate um, billiard trajectories to lines in the plane, we can also relate billiard trajectories to uh, lines in the torus, right? There's a straight line flow on the torus, and these <coughs> billiard trajectories unfold to give, to this, to give geodesics on the torus, or straight, you know, straight linear flow on the torus, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, so that was an example of a surface that tiled the plane by reflection. Um, <clears throat> so maybe I've Um, but not every, not every polygon has that property, tying the plane by reflection. Uh, let's look at uh, <coughs> polygon which doesn't. That would be this one. <coughs> this is uh, pi over 8. <coughs> Pi over 2, 3 pi over 8. Okay, so we can start unfolding uh, this polygon here by, say, flipping over this side. And then if we continue to flip around, what do we get? We get a, a picture that's like this. So I've been very lucky with my lines so far. I think I'll just stop here. Uh, but you see, this is, so this, uh, <coughs> this corresponds to a fundamental domain down here. <coughs> and when we do this reflection, uh, it fills out an octagon. Here I'm just ref doing reflections of these two sides, right? It fills out an octagon. It looks good so far. We're successfully tiling an octagon. But if we start doing reflections around this point, it, this is an exercise. If we start doing reflections around this point and keep reflecting, it doesn't match up when we come back. 
we have to keep going so that we fill out, uh, so in fact, the, yeah, so we have to keep going sort of three times, going around the circle three times before they match up again. Okay, so this one, uh, if, if we, this polygon here, so this P does uh, not pile uh, the plane by reflection. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> if we do r recall before, we had the option of looking at the complete unfolding in R2 or just the kind of the partial unfolding in the square. If we do this partial unfolding operation here, <coughs> we observe that, um, <coughs> that so this edge over here and this edge over there, they correspond to the same edge in our original polygon, but again, they're identified by a translation, right? There's no, there's no reflection. I mean, if we, right. <coughs> if, we, if we do this unfolding, we'd get another copy of the octagon over here, and these two octagons would differ exactly by a translation. So if we, as in the case of the torus, if we make the corresponding identifications of edges, identify that one, that one, that one, one and that one. Um, we it, we create a surface, and in this case, we're creating a translation surface. Okay, so uh, if, if uh, P is our polygon, uh, P uh, from uh, P, we can. <coughs> create a translation surface uh, M sub P. Okay, so I'm, I'm just using the letter M for my translation surface. I'm not using M comma omega. I'm just, um, okay, so not, I mean, Different speakers use different conditions. So, and when I write M, I'm, but I'm think, but but when I write M, I'm thinking of this single letter as incorporating both the surface and the translation structure on the surface. Okay, so it's de denoting both both things. We create a translation surface M sub P, and um, <coughs> in fact, this translation surface, unlike the previous case, will not be a torus. And we can, uh, uh, well, so uh, M sub P, this surface, in fact, has genus uh, 2. And it has uh, a singular point. With a cone angle uh, 6 pi. It has one singular point with cone angle 6 pi. So the um, schematically, I'll just denote it by like this. So we got one singular point with cone angle 6 pi. And that singular point corresponds to this, uh, this collection of points of the octagon. When we glue up the sides, all of these points get identified to a single point. Okay? So. Um, uh, okay, so <clears throat> we don't tile the plane. We do get a translation surface. Um, okay, so this construction, uh, <clears throat> the construction which associates to a rational polygon a translation surface, <clears throat> uh, so this uh, construction uh, was discovered by <coughs> by uh, Zimlyakov, uh, Katak in the sixties. <coughs>
and uh, uh, Fox uh, Kirshner uh, in the uh, 40s. Okay, so maybe like uh, Sasha's talk, a situation where people not exactly checking all the sources in the literature when they, but yeah. yeah so, uh, sorry, two questions. Uh, one is that uh, how many angles do we need to unfold to get this translation surface? In that case, one. In the previous case, just one. But in general, uh, how, many, how many angles do we need to unfold I mean, to do this? <laughs> well, maybe this, this, uh, this thing about unfolding specific angles is maybe a little bit misleading. It's not always a question of unfolding angles. Um, <coughs> you, you might, the, 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 the more general way to think about it is just <coughs> um, <coughs> there's, there's a, a, some sort of finite, well, here's the more general way to think about it, okay? So <coughs> if you look at the collection of uh, the re reflections around the sides, Think just of the linear part of those reflections that generates a subgroup group of O2, okay, of the orthogonal group, right? And the rationality condition means that, that subgroup is finite. The number of copies of the table that we need to use is the order of that group. And then, and there's some gluing. What, so if we just write down all those copies in the plane, there's some pattern of identifications. Maybe it's not a single octagon with the sides identified. Maybe it's just a bunch of polygons with different sides identified. Okay? Did you have a second question? Yeah. So, uh, so you mentioned that when we make the translation set result, uh, we the the number of uh, the number of uh, items inside that trans uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the of region of that translation surface is the number of. Uh, Possible directions, yeah. but that doesn't seem to be true for the first case. The for your first example about uh, okay, yeah. Well, so let me say just more generally, when I say something in this lecture, yeah. it doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> it just means it's a uh, a generally good indication of a direction in which to think. And yes, you're right. There are counterexamples to what I said. Okay, so uh, it is true. No, I think what I wrote <coughs> down was probably true. Uh, every, every, in every rational billiard, every trajectory goes in a finite number of directions. But I think you're maybe thinking of a case where that number of directions is not the same for each direction, right? Okay, so that, I, I agree with that. I'm, um, but, <coughs> well, so, uh, I, I know that this, is a, that this is a group that potentially asks a lot of questions. So, um, to, um, to punish you, uh, we've put together a list of problems uh, that we can refer you to uh, problems on this list. Or if you ask a question and we don't want to answer it, we'll say, oh, that's probably on the problem list. And then, uh, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll post this at some point. This, I mean, fairly soon, we'll post the list of problems. And yeah, OK. OK, so that's the connection between uh, polygons and um, translation services. So uh, <coughs> just for historical reasons, uh, let me point out. So uh, Zemlyakov, we're thinking about this question about trajectories being uniformly distributed or, or not uniformly distributed. And Fox and Kirshner were thinking about this question about denseness of trajectories. But they're, okay. But they both led to this uh, connection to translation surfaces. Okay, so um, so I, I told you that what we were interested in was this uh, counting problem for counting uh, closed trajectories. So I want to return to that uh, uh, so counting uh, I should say counting. Uh, closed uh, trajectories. <clears throat> okay, so as a warm-up, 
Let's look at the uh, correspond the question of counting closed trajectories in the case of the torus. Okay, so uh, and in the case the, the case of the torus will be similar or uh, any any polygon that tiles the plane by unfolding will also be analyzed by the same method. Okay, so let me just let's uh, <coughs> so special case. Uh, so I, I mean, I can think of in general. Uh, let's see, let me maybe I can introduce some terminology. Uh, the uh, integrable case, uh, P tiles the plane, plane by reflection. Uh, <coughs> M sub P is a torus, and the quasi uh, integrable case uh, M sub P is a surface of higher genus. Okay, so this uh, terminology comes from physicists who studied um, uh, polygonal billiards in the 80s and 90s. Uh, they were interested in uh, questions of quantum chaos. Well, who knows what quantum chaos is, but we can at least borrow their language uh, <laughs> to give ourselves a, an aura or sense of talking about physics. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, so let me, so, so integrable, um, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I went to a conference at some point in the, in the 80s, uh, invited by uh, some physicists, and um, it was very interesting, and they had a lot of interesting uh, questions, um, they actually built microwave categories, microwave cavities in the shape of polygonal billiards to test the, uh, the spectrum, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the energy levels. Um, <coughs> and uh, they had a lot of interesting questions. And I, I, I asked uh, <coughs> the organizer of the conference uh, you know, uh, 10 years later, well, how's, how's it going? How's the understanding of quantum chaos going? He said, oh, we're done. <laughs> It's great, you know. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I want to look at this Taurus case. Okay, so as we know, in, the, uh, in this integral case, it's useful. I mean, we have the option of looking at R2, understanding, uh, <coughs> understanding our trajectories in R2, so let's take advantage of that. <coughs> so uh, let's uh, so let's let's look at the square torus. Uh, torus. Uh, so it's R2 mod uh, Z2. But let me let me just scale it. I mean, allow myself to scale. The torus, torus. I mean, tori come in different sizes. Uh, so this will be. This side will have length a. This side will have length a. So if we have any uh, any integrable integral point like uh, a m over a n with m n in z then we can draw a uh, straight line to that point. And this straight line will project to a, a closed curve on the torus. Uh, let me just, I'll, instead of making, uh, so it's closed curve. Okay, so 
what we can uh, attempt to do here is count, uh, well, okay, so we, we get a closed curve on the torus. Um, <coughs> not a unique curve, right? But the, uh, the curves, if we take this closed curve and we translate it, we get another closed curve. So we get a family of closed curves, but they all have, all of these closed curves have the same length. Okay, so, so our problem is, instead of just, instead of saying we're counting closed trajectories, we're counting, uh, we could say we're counting families, fam, families of closed trajectories, and we're, we're doing it by length. Uh, so, the, since the length is well defined in the family, that's a reasonable problem. Okay, so, so say we want to let, uh, let uh, n uh, of L, and I'll, I'll just write T for the torus. So, let's say T equal R2 mod lambda AZ2. So, let, let me define this to be equal to B the uh, number of uh, closed of length uh, less than or equal to L. Okay, and then uh, to in terms of our picture, what we can do is we can draw a large disk. Uh, we can draw a disk of radius L, and we can count the, uh, the lattice points. So let's say, uh, let me write lambda is A times Z2. So this is uh, a lattice. And T equals R2 mod lambda. So we can count the points in lambda inside this large disk, okay? And uh, we can get uh, uh, an estimate on the number of points in terms of the areas of these fundamental domains, right? So what we get is, um, uh, what we get is in sub t of L, it's uh, asymptotic to um, the area of the disk, which is pi L squared, divided by the area of the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the torus, which is A. Let me just write this. <coughs> Let me write A for the area. OK, so we get an asymptotic for the number of lattice points inside the disk, right? Okay. <coughs> okay. Well, okay. So I, I was expecting a complaint at this point. are no complaints, but expecting a complaint. Uh, well, so the complaint relates to the fact that it is true that each of these uh, lattice points gives us a family of trajectories, but it's not necessarily true that two distinct lattice points give us distinct trajectories, okay? So that was, right, because uh, <clears throat> if you take a, uh, a lattice point, like say this point is uh, the lattice, the point uh, like 2, 1, and you look at, you double it, you get another lattice point, but it really corresponds to the same trajectory where you've just um, gone around it twice, right? Okay, so, so, if we really want to count trajectories uh, <coughs> as opposed to lattice points, um, okay. So, so the problem is uh, this uh, overcounts uh, trajectories, closed trajectories, <coughs> if we 
really want to count, oh, there's two things we have to do. Uh, one is uh, consider uh, orientation. Uh, so uh, each, uh, each orientation gives us a different lattice point. So we have to divide by two. And, uh, and then we don't want to do this multiple counting. So we, we take only, take only uh, points uh, A, M, A, N, where uh, uh, M and N are relatively prime. Okay, so uh, this uh, gives a factor of two. Of two, and uh, this <coughs> we have to consider what's the chance that a random pair of integers m and n are relatively prime, and that's a kind of cute uh, exercise in number theory. So the <coughs> chance that um, uh, m, n are relatively prime is uh, 1 over zeta of 2, where uh, zeta of 2 is the summation n equal 1 to infinity, 1 over n squared. Okay. That's the problem. I mean, that, this is an um, <coughs> exercise for you to, to do. It's, it's cute, doable. Um, okay. Okay, so putting that together, what do we get for our, um, our answer? We get that the correct answer <coughs> is uh, n sub. Okay, so this is the case of the torus. So n sub t of L is asymptotic to uh, pi L squared over A times 1 half times 1 over zeta of 2. And let me just write that as C times L squared over A where <coughs> Uh, the constant c is equal to pi over 2 times zeta of 2. Okay, so this is, <clears throat> this is, the, the, this in fact will be the pattern that we're going to look for. We expect to see this many closed geodesics should grow quadratically with L and then there should be some mystery content, mystery constant, and sometimes the mystery content might have some cute or extra interesting information, okay? So that's the, that's the pattern we hope to see in general. Um, but we don't have, um, we don't have, we can't, don't have this option of uh, going to the plane, the lattice isn't the plane in order to do the, do the calculation. So uh, the question is, what can we do? Uh, what technique can we use? And uh, well, Pascal pointed out that it's actually not a problem. There is only one technique in dynamics, which is renormalization. So obviously, we have to use renormalization <laughs> here. Um, OK. so. Um, let me, let me, uh, well, so uh, renormalization comes in different flavors, but, uh, so there, uh, I might say there's different renormalization schemes, but each of these scheme, renormalization schemes takes a little bit of work to set up, right? I mean, we saw uh, rosy induction, that's one example of renormalization scheme. This renormalization scheme is a, a little bit different. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me set this up. <coughs> um, actually, so, so what I want to do, do is I want to go back 
look at the case, the, the integrable case, and uh, do the same, try to do the same analysis by using so the same problem, redo it, using renormalization ideas, hopefully getting the same answer. Uh, but the advantage of doing that is that the renormalization ideas will extend to general translation surfaces, whereas the, the previous argument is very to the uh, integrable case. Okay, so that's the game. Any questions? Okay. Uh, so um, I want a, um, a sort of a space on which our renormalization operator will work. And uh, we've seen this space before, but let me just describe it again. <coughs> okay, so uh, I want to consider the space <coughs> of... Um, <coughs> Unimod of marked uh, unimodular uh, lattices in uh, lattices lambda in R2. Okay, so uh, <coughs> so our space is basically we'll get money the space. Of, of lattices, our space on which our renormalization operator will work is the space of lattices. Um, to say that it's marked means I'm choosing an explicit basis for my lattice. So this, this is the la a lattice lambda, and lambda is equal to uh, mv plus nw, uh, mn uh, in z. Okay, so a lattice has many representations in this form. I'm choosing one of them. And then unit modular means that my fundamental domain <coughs> for this lattice has uh, area one. Okay, so uh, associated to, so this lambda, I can associate it to a pair, to the pair of vectors V and W. I just write my vectors as column vectors a, b, w equals c, d. Then I can associate this to a matrix a, b, c, d. And the area condition means that this matrix is in SL 2R. Right? So my space of marked lattices, uh, sort of the, the moduli space of marked unimodular lattices is SL 2R. Okay, now, okay, so uh, now I want to uh, under I want to also consider the space of unmarked lattices, <coughs> and uh, we've seen this kind of discussion before. Uh, <coughs> the change, uh, changing uh, the marking. corresponds to, <coughs> to the uh, right action <coughs> of SL2Z, right? Where SL2 just, it's acting SL2R by matrix multiplication, but it's acting on the right. Pardon? That was wrong. <laughs> this week, we're going to do things correctly. <laughs> OK? So uh, just check. Just check. Check this. Do this computation. I, I didn't choose right action. I said we're going to look at unmarked lattices. SL2Z, the change in marking, does correspond to the right. It's not a choice. OK, in some areas of homogeneous dynamics, you have a choice of right or left actions. And of course, this choice divides communities, <laughs> splits families, <laughs> causes wars, etc. In this particular analysis, there is no choice, OK? So it's the right action. 
So in particular, translation surfaces as opposed to homo people in homogeneous dynamics, it's one happy family. <laughs> Okay, so uh, if we want to look at the space of, so the space of uh, unmarked lattices, uh, the modular lattices, uh, or equivalently uh, a tori with uh, area one. Is is accor according to this? It's uh, S L to R modulo S L to Z. Okay. So and then uh, this be this these spaces of of surfaces. So this is a space of tori. tori. These spaces of, tor of surfaces in general and translation surfaces are called strata. So, uh, so this is the stratum of uh, tori, and let me let me just for convenience assume that uh, my torus has a specific point, which I'm thinking of as either the origin in this picture or maybe the vertex in the in the previous picture. So <coughs> that and okay, so then my uh, the flat surface language we'd call this. H1 0. So this is the stratum notation. This 0 means it has one marked point and the cone angle at that point is 2 pi. Okay. Eight, the 1 means it has area 1. Okay. So this is uh, uh, so, <coughs> so, this, so this is the definition of the stratum of tori. Okay. So uh, that's the space I want to consider. And then just to review, re recall, recall. Um, oh, let's see. So if I, uh, um, I would, yeah. Just to make sure these guys are unmarked, but they are still oriented, right? You cannot exchange B and W. They're unmarked. They're oriented. They are oriented. Yes, they are oriented. Yes. Okay. And these are, are not lattices up to rotation. These are lattices, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not doing up to rotation. I'm doing just honest lattices. Okay, so um, uh, in general, when we have a stratum of translation surfaces, there's also an SL2R action. Let me just say what that is. Let's just remind you what that is in this particular case. Uh, so uh, we have a, uh, I may just call it a geometric uh, SL2R uh, action uh, on uh, the space of tori on H1. And that, if we think of our torus as being given by a, uh, a particular fundamental domain, right? if this is a, a fundamental domain, and we have some matrix A in SL to R, then we get some, we can just apply this linear transformation to this fundamental domain. We get some new, um, some new fundamental domain, <clears throat> but it still gives us a torus because the linear a linear map preserves it doesn't preserve lengths of sides, but it preserves the property of being parallel. So we can still glue these things together, right? So in the language of tori, this is the SL2R action. In the language of uh, we can also think of this in the language of axis. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> And then um, uh, reinforcing this idea that there are no uh, ambiguities in flat surfaces, uh, another uh, exercise uh, in, uh, okay, so 
if we, we can identify each of these, we can identify this torus with the lattice and the lattice with the matrix, uh, <coughs> geometric SL2R uh, action uh, corresponds to to left multiplication. on SL2R. Okay, and um, as uh, Mateus pointed out, the left, action, left actions and right actions commute, so this left action is defined not just on SL2R, but it's defined on uh, or on SL2R uh, modulo SL2Z. Okay, so um, <coughs> it's good that these actions, I mean, okay, so it's convenient here that these actions are coming on opposite sides, so we can define this SL2R action in general. And this SL2R action on, uh, on, on strata is an important tool in many problems, not just this one. <coughs> um, okay, I guess at some point I have to hide all the, this material uh, by bringing down the second board. Um, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, 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 so Pascal and uh, uh, Chris uh, considered uh, a uh, one parameter sub of uh, SL2R, uh, which is, let me call that a specific G sub T, T over 2, 0, 0, E to the minus T over 2. Well, at this point, I have to admit that uh, translation surface people is not one happy family. Uh, there is a, uh, there is, there's tension uh, about this too. Okay, so, um, Chris, did you have the two or no two? No two for Chris. I'm not sure, I can't really remember if Pascal had the two or not, but okay, I just, I just want to set up. There are, there is a little bit. It's not completely uh, a happy family. Notice that uh, if if Chris had used the two, then he would have found that the conformal conformal distortion uh, is uh, e to the t. Right, because you divide the length of the major axis by the length of the minor axis, right? So, okay. Um, <coughs> pardon? Yeah, that's an, I have to explain that one too, okay, so. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so, well, okay. So, uh, but here, here's, the, here's, the, here's my, I mean, the reason I want to put the two in, okay, perhaps, Perhaps being at, at odds with the first week speaker, the reason I want to put the two in is, uh, so this uh, corresponds to, uh, to the uh, geodesic flow uh, on uh, the, hyperbol upper, on the hyperbolic planar upper half space uh, parameterized with unit speed. where uh, uh, H has curvature, uh, H is chosen to have curvature minus one, okay? So, uh, so this will be useful for me, okay? Uh, at the risk, I mean, at the risk of stirring up my colleagues, I'm gonna stick with this, okay. Um, 
OK, so <coughs> now what is the problem in general with uh, counting or, or analyzing geodesic, geodesics? Well, we're looking at uh, you know, the asymptotic behavior of closed geodesics. So the problem is really that geodesics are, that geodesics are long. If geodesics were short, it wouldn't be so hard to count them, right? We could just, okay, so that we want to use, so in our case, we want to uh, sort of use renormalization to take long geodesics and, and make them shorter, okay? So, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the trade off for that is we're taking long geodesics on our original surface. And after renormalization, we'll get shorter geodesics on a different surface. Okay, so there's something that we'll have to worry about. Yeah? You always say it's long if the short geodesics are long. Why is that? Why are the closed geodesics long? Well, why is this problem? If the short why is a prop well, <coughs> okay, you know, maybe it's not so maybe it's maybe it's not so much of a problem in the plane, but if you think of geodesics on the octagon and you're doing this kind of unfolding operation, uh, you've got lots of unfolding to do, quite complicated. I mean, th so it, it is harder, much harder to analyze long geodesics on, say, the octagon than on the torus. Okay, but for which technique? For which technique? Yeah. Um, uh, for which technique? For a, um, I don't know. For uh, if you want to, if you want to understand them by <coughs> unfolding your fundamental domain, say, right? Unfolding the fundamental domain straightens, you know, turns your geodesic into a straight line. If you want to use that technique, it would be hard to deal with long ones. But in general, uh, in dynamic, in, in all of these problems, in, in dynamics, <coughs> the uh, problem of dynamics is understanding the future, or things, you know, a long time in the future. That's the problem. It's easy to, I mean, so you're, you're considering <coughs> long intervals of time. That's typically the problem. So, <coughs> um, OK. OK, so what, what we want to do here is use this left SL2R action, the geometric SL2R action, uh, <coughs> the geometric SL2R action to shorten our geodesics. OK, we do that in two two steps. Um, first, uh, okay, maybe this is a good time to um, switch boards here. So let uh, R theta equal uh, cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta. Okay, so recall, I mean, this, this uh, geodesic flow, and we have, as before, g sub t equals e to the e to the t over 2. 0, 0, e minus t over 2. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to use these two, two operations to, uh, <clears throat> so here's, here's some uh, geodesic gamma, and let me just think of gamma as a point in our lattice, and I want to use these operations to shorten gamma, okay? Now, recall that the geodesic flow is designed to shorten vertical trajectories, right? That's just by, by condition. So uh, our gamma is not a priori vertical, but we can rotate it till it becomes vertical. Okay, so here's gamma, and then we can do uh, our theta of gamma. We can rotate it by some theta, maybe theta sub gamma. Uh, so, so in this has, say, <coughs> length L. And then we can rotate it, and we get something here of length L. And then we can apply g sub t and shrink it. Okay. So let me uh, 
let uh, epsilon greater than zero be given. Uh, so I just want say I want to shrink my trajectory to length epsilon. Okay, I've got a long trajectory. I want to make it short. Okay, epsilon. I want to make it length. Give it length epsilon. So so I want to consider uh, g sub. Uh, let me just. Oh. Calculation, agree with my notes. Yeah. Uh, G sub t, r sub theta of gamma, where, uh, so I want this to have length epsilon. If I calculate, right, so, so the vertical trajectory is the one that's getting shrunk, right? It's the, it's the negative here. We, we all agree about that. Uh, so if I want this, Okay, so I want uh, this to have length epsilon. Okay, so that gives me an equation. So for t, so let's take t equal to log, uh, uh, I mean, so solving the equation, um, we get this this expression for t. Okay, so we've we've sh we've rotated, so and then we've rotated, so we get this long trajectory. Now, in a different lattice here, this is our g sub t, our theta of gamma, and the length uh, is equal to epsilon. Okay. Okay. So as in the as in many situations in renormalization. You start, you, you talk for a while, and you just, you haven't really accomplished anything, right? I mean, oh, I've changed the labels. Uh, you know, what is the point of renormalization? Okay, so I'm still in the talking phase. It still seems pointless, but um, hopefully we'll get to, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, so renormalization. Re for a while, nothing happens, and then it's over, and something has happened, and you don't know what, right? That's renormalization. Okay. Um, let's see. 15, 16, 17. Okay, so, so uh, we've shortened our trajectory, but we've changed our surface, right? So the question is, <coughs> let's recall uh, Pascal's picture of uh, moduli space. Here we, this is the... Uh, the right way. So moduli space is uh, SL. Well, so this is the moduli space of uh, surfaces. This is the, sort of the classic moduli space. Uh, SO2. Okay, and then as Pascal explained, the, um, the space of trans translation surfaces is the unit tangent bundle of this space. Okay, so to draw a translation surface, we draw a vector like that. Okay, so step one, so I want to, I want to, so let me consider, I want to consider the set G sub T R theta, where T is fixed and theta is in uh, zero to pi. Okay, so I, I want to spin, I'm allowing my, my direction to spin around the circle. Okay, so that's that's the effect of r theta, and then I want to apply g sub t. So I'm traveling for distance t. So what am I getting? I'm getting a circle of radius t. Okay, it's a circle of radius t, but it's mapped into the moduli space, so it's maybe folded around a bit. Okay, so uh, another way of, of doing this is space here, and draw the fundamental plane in this. Then just uh, we're just traveling out for distance t. 
Okay, so this is distance, we're traveling for distance t. So I've got a circle of, of length t. <coughs> and then the claim is that uh, <coughs> uh, geodesics of length L, uh, L correspond to, oh yeah, let me see, let's see. Let's see, I, I want to draw one more part of this picture. So we have these two uh, sort of singular points. This is, right, this is a class we call the modular curve. We have these two singular points, but we also have this part out here. And uh, this consists of very degenerate tori, right, which look like uh, bicycle inner tubes, right? So tiny diameter and long, uh, you know. So degenerate tori, and let me write C sub epsilon equals set of uh, tori <coughs> with uh, uh, closed orbits, trajectories of length uh, less than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so it's the cusp, right? C sub epsilon is sort of a particular part of the cusp of this surface. What we've established length epsilon, uh, length L, correspond to uh, visits of the uh, circle of uh, radius R, a uh, radius T to uh, C sub epsilon. Okay, so this is my, so the renormalization has turned my question about the torus into some question about large circles in the moduli space of the torus. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's what renormalization has done for us. It's transformed our question from an easy question into a really hard question. Great. Um, okay, now, uh, so <coughs> then what we saw bef when we did this is that the, we want, a, we're expecting the, uh, <coughs> we're expecting uh, the number of these, the number of these visits should grow quadratically, right, in, in L, right, because we saw that before. Uh, why does the number of visits grow quadratically? <coughs> so number of uh, cusp excursions <coughs> uh, <coughs> So it should grow quadratically. Let's as let me assume every time we visit the cusp we spend the same amount of time, every cusp excursion, we spend the same amount of time in the cusp. Okay? It's, it's false, but I'm just asking you to go with me on this, on this point. So let's just assume every time we visit, we spend the same amount of time in the cusp. Okay? Yeah? What do you mean by visiting? Uh, so, large circle. Yeah. It's moving around this, this space. A visit, I mean, at some, for some theta values, that circle will be in the cusp, okay? So, so here, my, down in this lower picture, the cusp, the cusp looks something like this. A visit is some particular interval where this large circle is intersecting this, uh, this is a horror disk, okay? I'm counting that number of intervals. I want to count the number of intervals. Okay, so I've got the circle. The circle is, uh, you know, it's, <coughs> I've got various, down in this picture, I've had various copies of the cusp. I'm counting, and so this time we missed the cusp. Here we hit the cusp. There's one, there's two, there's three. Okay, so I'm counting those. I want to count those. Yeah. Are we still talking about closed geodesics or not? Yes. Always closed geodesics. So that's why, that's why my correspond to lattice points, gamma, lambda. Uh, 
closed geodesic somewhere else? No, this is not a closed geodesic. I've moved from a question about closed geodesics on my surface to a question about circles in my moduli space. Yeah, I, this, I could, right. This is, so this is tight, I'm, I've, I've drawn the universal cover. This is like more like tight motor space. This is moduli space. So really I should draw a long, complicated circle in this space of great combinatorial complexity. Uh, that's another homework exercise. Draw that. <laughs> I mean, it's easier to draw. I'm just drawing here because it's easier to draw. But you can see by the way that this circle passes through these various fundamental domains that it's winding around here, right? No, this, the, 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 um, this is a circle. The red is a circle. It's not a geodesic, but it is a circle. Geodesics correspond to specific circles that are perpendicular to the boundary. This circle doesn't hit the boundary. It's not a geodesic, but it is a circle. This is not the orbits of renormalization, right? Orbits of renormalization, right? It's not the orbits of renormalization, right? Uh, when Pascal used renormalization, he was looking at the orbits of renormalization. I'm looking at something different. Yes. Yeah. So it's clear that every closed geodesic of lengths less than n corresponds to some excursion into cusp, but why cannot it happen that several correspond to a single excursion? So, uh, several geodesics, different geodesics of lengths less than L correspond to the same excursion. Oh, cusp. yeah. Fortunately, that's an exercise. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's good, very good question. A key feature of the torus, but that is, yeah, it is the case. Okay. So, um, uh, let's, okay, so let's, uh, so I've, I've uh, convinced you to pretend that each excursion, uh, each excursion is, that is each of the, I'm, I'm pretending that each of these intervals has the same length, okay? So I can, uh, so what I want to do, so, uh, uh, <coughs> okay, so if that's true, and if this circle is sort of filling up, un filling up the modular curve uniformly, then we expect the number of visits to this cusp to be proportional to the volume of this cusp, or the area of this cusp. Okay, so, so what I want to do is, let's see, so assume, that uh, large circles, are <coughs> uniformly distributed uh, in, in, say, the mod modular curve, okay? In this picture, assume that they're filling up space uniformly, okay? So, so the amount of time spent in the cusp should be proportional to the, to the uh, volume of the cusp or the area of the cusp, right? If they're kind of, and we're also assuming that every visit to the cusp has about you're spending about the same amount of time. So then the number of the number of visits should be proportional to the length of this circle, with my with my assumptions. Okay, so assume so this is, uh, so in H, say H one zero. Okay, well we're going to assume that, then uh, <coughs> with these assumptions, uh, number of cusps <coughs> is should be approximately uh, <coughs> the, uh, the area of C sub epsilon divided by the area of, of, the, modu of the modular curve. Okay? Pardon? Sorry, then the number of excursions, uh, or cusp excursions. Okay, so I'm making a, a dynamical assumption 
which is exactly one that, that Barack will come back to in future lectures about this uniform distribution. Okay, but uh, uh, so, yeah, question. Uh, sorry, uh, I missed that word. Uh, what, what did you mean by distorted? Uh, uh, distributed, uniformly distributed. Oh, oh, thank you. Okay, so it's kind of filling up any given region. It's it, the amount of time it's spent in that region is proportional to the area of that region. Oh. Okay, so that's what I mean by uniformly uh, distributed. Oh, yes, so Okay, part of the challenge of renormalization is you're supposed to hold two pictures in your mind simultaneously. Okay? One is what's going on on the torus. Okay? On the torus, we have a closed orbit. The other picture is what's going on on the moduli space of tori. On the moduli space of tori, we have this large uh, circle, not a, okay. Well, maybe that wasn't, actually, maybe I'm not answering your question. Say the question again. Yeah, yeah. No, e you're right. Absolutely. Uh, each cer no circle is uniformly distributed, but the claim is at, let's what happens as t increases. As t increases, we want it to fill up more and more. So I wasn't careful about my thetas and my t's. So you're yeah. You're right. But uh, okay. So so let's if we do the calculation. <coughs> so the uh, the length of the circle. Of, sir, of the circle. So this is this is just a hyperbolic geometry. Yeah. Uh, what's what's this one? No. This one, modular curve. I just mean this area of the modular curve. Modular surface. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Curve would be like algebraic geometry. That'd be like uh, Daryl Land's talk. Right. Modular surface. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the length of the circle. So fortunately, I use the t over two, so I can just look up the length of a the the length of a circle of radius t in Wikipedia. Okay, <laughs> and it is uh, two pi a cent of uh, t, which when t is large, this is essentially two pi. Uh, e to the t over 2, which is just pi e to the t. Okay, and if we plug this into our formula over there, we get the, we get the, so this would be proportional, no, okay, this is proportional to the number of cusp excursions, so uh, uh, this is the length of, this is the length of the circle, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, Length of the circle of, of radius, and then we have a formula for t in terms of L. Uh, so in terms of L, we get, uh, just plugging that in, we get pi equals pi over epsilon times L squared, okay? So the square comes out here just from hyperbolic geometry, okay? So it doesn't have anything to do with the plane in particular. And that's the amazing thing about this renormalization method is it's gonna prove that the number of uh, closed geodesics or for any uh, polygonal billiard grows quadratically and the quadratic, it's, it comes from this and it comes from me putting the two in the formula for the geodesic flow, right? Okay, so, uh, okay, so, so that's one question about the, the constant, I mean, the, the, the exponent it should be two, and then there's a question about what should the constant be? Well, it's not surprising in this. Don't you uh, also have an epsilon squared? In terms, uh, no, not, uh, is it? Oh, is it epsilon squared? I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, good. <clears throat> so, um, and then it's not surprising that the, so what we expect here, what we expect in general is that this number of closed geodesics in any case, not just the torus, but in any case, should grow like 
um, uh, uh, L, a constant times L squared, okay? And the constant is going to be related to the volume of, the, of your moduli space, or it's the ratio of the volume of the moduli space to the volume of the epsilon cusp. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the general picture. Um, let's see, I think I have zero minutes, or no, one minute and 30 seconds left. Okay, one minute and 30 seconds, uh, which I, okay, so, uh, okay, let, let me say briefly, uh, what, how do you ex extend this idea to other polygons, okay? Well, in other polygons, Again, we get some stratum H alpha. Here, the alpha will correspond to the singularities of the associated surface. We have an SL2R action, a uh, geometric SL2R action, which is described by the same picture. Okay? So we have some notion of circles, right? So what we need to show, we need to show that uh, uh, large uh, circles uh, equidistribute. Okay? But here's an observation. <coughs> the circles are all, if we, so what have, in the particular case of the modular curve, this SL2R, SL2R action is acting transitively on our stratum. In general, the dimension of the stratum goes up, so the SL2R action is no longer transitive. In general, the, um, uh, these large circles are contained, the large circles are contained in the SL2R orbit of our point, and the limits of large circles are contained in the orbit closure of our point. So we're considered, so, <coughs> so we're concerned with uh, uh, SL. So we're looking at the action of SL2R on our stratum, and we're applying it to our surface M, and then we're taking the closure contained in H alpha. And to, to do the same kind of analysis that we did, we would like to know, and so this orbit closure might not be the entire stratum, okay? Might be something smaller. Well, in general, in dynamics, orbit closures can be terrible. So that's not a happy, you know, this is not, not looking good at the moment. But the amazing thing that happens here is because of a result of uh, Eskin, um, uh, Eskin, Mirzakhani, and Mohammadi, uh, it turns out that every orbit closure is, in fact, a very nice subspace. It has some analog of something like Haar measure on this orbit closure. It has a nice measure on the orbit closure. And in fact, it has all the structure that we need to do this argument. OK? So, um, so uh, what, we, what, what Barack will talk about is building on the, this kind of more general setting, understanding these orbit closures, and uh, we'll be sort of assuming this result. Uh, we'll, we'll see examples of nice uh, orbit closures and applying this methods of analysis in the, in the case of these other orbit closures, uh, I guess mostly in genus 2, right? I mean, we've done genus 1, and we'll mostly be thinking about genus 2. Let me stop there. <laughs>